So welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. And my guest today is Dr. Matt Brown. So Dr. Matthew Brown is a psychiatrist and he's currently practicing in Chicago. So Matthew, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm really interested to talk to you today. Uh, and if you if you don't follow Matt on Twitter, he's a great follow on Twitter. Uh, puts out a lot of uh, really good studies and uh, you know retweets a lot of things that that I'm very interested in. And you know that's you know part of the reason why I wanted to to chat with you today. Um, but before we kind of get into it, maybe you can just give the audience a little bit more of, of a background on yourself and, and how you got into uh, psychiatry. Uh, well, how I got into psychiatry. I mean, that's a, a longer story but so um i guess uh, i stumbled into that i mean like uh in, in undergrad that I, I started off as a computer science major um and and i took a class and it was a weed out class and i absolutely hated it and so i had no idea what i wanted to do so i just started taking classes that seemed like fun i ended up taking some film studies classes and some psychology classes that kind of stuck um started working in some research labs uh, in, in the psychology department uh worked in uh uh, addictions uh, with, with alcohol, worked uh, on a few uh, sexual functioning studies uh, through the Kinsey Institute. Um, and then uh, I got into a child development lab, and I thought that was actually a lot more fun than some of the vice stuff that I was doing. Um, my senior year, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I thought like, well, I can move to LA, try to get into the film industry, because again, that was like half of what I was doing. But then I thought, well, I don't know, uh, medicine's interesting. Um, and, and therapy is interesting. So I was going to go in maybe into clinical psychology, but I thought, well, no, I want to prescribe drugs. So stuck around for an extra year, decided to do the pre-med thing, went into medical school again with the idea of like helping kids, um, and always doing the, the psychology thing. So I decided to become a child psychiatrist and, um, no, oh, here I am. So that's how I got into psychiatry. Awesome. So, uh, how long have you been practicing now for? Uh, wow. Uh, I mean, technically a little over like this will be next year will be 11 years. So crap, it's a long time. And um, so, you know, at the uh, start of the show, I mentioned that, you know, we're, we're both, you know, very much into researching psychedelics. So, um, you know, I've had, uh, well, Ben on here before, but I haven't had too many other um, psychiatrists on here before. So just kind of interested in, in how did you uh, get interested in, in psychedelics in terms of um, psychiatry? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. I, so in my um, psychiatry residency during the second year, uh, we had to staff the psychiatric emergency department for about four months at nighttime. Um, and, and during that time, you know, we're kind of like live the, the vampire lifestyle, you know, awake all night and sleeping during the day. And so I didn't have like a lot of contact with a lot of other people other than you know, the, the nursing staff and the, the patients coming in through the ER. Uh, so I started doing a lot of reading started listening to some podcasts and uh, I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how uh, ayahuasca uh, is used um, in, in Peru to uh, help heal psychiatric illness, uh, stuff like that. And I thought this is very, very bizarre. I'd never heard of this before. Um, you know, like I'm in psychiatry, like this seems interesting, but then I thought like, well, not too much of it. Um, later on that same week, I walked into one of my uh, attending physician's offices and, and I commented on a painting that he had on the wall that I thought it was really cool. And he's like, oh, you like that painting? Uh, that painting's of an ayahuasca vision. Have you ever heard of ayahuasca? And I thought, this is bizarre. This is too weird. And so he went into uh, a whole big spiel about how he was originally from Peru. Um, and one of his big dreams in life is trying to like merge his, like the, the native healing methods um, uh, of down in Peru with like Western medicine. Um, and, you know, I got hooked, started doing a lot of reading and down the rabbit hole I went, basically. Amazing. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think a lot of people kind of, you know, stumble onto psychedelics, you know, especially in terms of, um, you know, academics. But I mean, you know, broadly speaking, most people, I think, stumble on them. But in terms of academics, like, it's not something that we're taught in school, you know, like, I'm a, I'm a family trained, uh, family medicine trained doctor. So, you know, I wasn't taught that. But I mean, obviously, you're, you're, a, you're a, a psychiatrist, and you have, you know, much more um, you know, education in that department, and you still didn't receive any, you know, education on any of these medicines, right, which seem to be, you know, quite effective. I mean, we're, we are, you know, certainly teasing out a lot of the, uh, the evidence now, but, you know, certainly it all seems to point to it being, you know, incredibly efficacious overall. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 
um, your patients right now, you know, are you able to use any of these um, medicines with, with your patients or is it still something that, you know, can't be used in, in, in Chicago and, and, um, and in uh, the places that you practice? Well, I mean, the really the only agent that we have in the United States right now that's prescribable, uh, that's not really a schedule one that would be considered a psychedelic is ketamine. Um, and, I, and I do use that with, uh, with some patients. Um, probably I've got, mm, I don't know, maybe about like 10 folks uh, right now. I mean, the vast majority of the, my clientele, I'm not doing that with. Um, prior to the, the pandemic, uh, I was doing some of the more high dose stuff and it was getting some pretty good results, like surprisingly with, uh, some folks with treatment resistant depression, um, OCD. Um, although since the pandemic started, um, you know, I tried to do like one high dose session, like via zoom, uh, and, and it was fine. Honestly, the, the, the person said that they got benefit, but there's, um, as, as you might've read about, there's a lot of, uh, to do with like set and setting. Uh, with, with psychedelics and it just the feel wasn't quite the same for me and I just didn't really like the almost like the voyeuristic thing of like just looking through the screen and watching somebody at their in, in their home um, so since then I've kind of switched to what's considered more like psycholytic therapy uh, where I'm doing significantly lower doses and um, along with just uh, like cognitive processing like psychodynamic psychotherapy um, and that too is that's, that's been really rewarding actually I like that I mean it, it's different I'm in some ways, I like it more. Um, but, but so that's what I've been doing with that. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've been prescribing ketamine now for uh, a couple of years. And um, last week, actually, uh, the podcast actually should, should drop today that with the uh, lady, Dr. Tatiana Zib in, uh, in, in London. So she's a clinical psychologist. So we, we've teamed up and, you know, basically what happens is I'll assess the patient and prescribe them ketamine. And then, um, and then she'll do uh, ketamine assisted um, psychotherapy. So I prescribe it as well as uh, a monotherapy. So, you know, I do have patients take it at home on their own and they've, and they've done very well with that. And I've been, you know, published for, for, uh, for using it as a monotherapy as well, but the dose that I use is very, very low. So, you know, when you're taking it orally, um, the absorption of ketamine, unfortunately is, is very, very poor. So for my patients, you know, they, I say to them, like, you have to take it on an empty stomach. You know, if you don't take mm -hmm. it on an empty stomach, it's, it's basically going to be, you know, worthless. Um, not that there's any danger to it. It's just that you're not going to get any of the benefit of the medicine because you're not really um, going to be absorbing it. So my patients, you know, generally take 75 milligrams uh, three times a week is how we usually start it. And, um, you know, the first, the first time or first couple times, they may feel um, like fairly dissociated. And then um, after that, you know, and I know there's some sort of like controversy about this. I mean, some of my patients indicate that even though they don't get as dissociated as they did initially, they still get the benefit. But I have read, um, you know, in some medical journals that uh, generally speaking, the people who feel more dissociated get more benefit. Um, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to give away your protocols or anything like that. But, you know, generally speaking, you know, how do you start off your patients with, with dosing with regards to, to, uh, to, to, uh, ketamine? Uh, I, somewhat similar, actually. I, I, I don't, I start everybody. Look, so again, I'm a child psychiatrist and my training has always been like start low, go slow. Um, right. and so for anybody, for, for anything, I tend to start on a significantly lower dose than I, I would expect them to get up to. Um, and so, and so I don't know if you were saying you're doing just oral, or if you're talking about sublingual, um, cause like, of course, oral, like oral, is like, oral capsule. Yeah. So what oral capsule. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm mostly doing sublingual trochies, uh, just because the, the absorption is a little bit better with that. Um, well, roughly about twice. Um, but, uh, yeah, starting off with, well, depending on the age, uh, we might even go like start off with like some sort of a syrup um, at like super, super, super low doses and very, very slowly titrate up over a couple of days if we're doing it. Because um, I do have like a chronic pain um, slash depression protocol that's a little bit different okay. than, the, um, the, the, than the, the psycholytic therapy protocol. But in therapy, normally we're, uh, we're starting with somewhere around the, the neighborhood of like, I don't know, like, like 12 and a half uh, milligrams, like, uh, underneath the tongue, uh, and then slowly working our way up until they feel effects. 
Um, and then we'll keep trying to push it until they maybe get a little bit uncomfortable. And so, yeah, there is a minor dissociation that tends to happen. And also there is a tolerance that happens over time. Um, and so just trying to find the place where um, you know, their defenses feel like they're, they're down enough to, to, to do some extra processing, because that seems to be the, uh, the, the, one of the, the magics of pairing that with therapy, right? So the, the idea being, it's, it, what I tell people, it's kind of like having like two or three glasses of wine type of a thing. So, you know, you might yeah. be a little bit more open and kind of like share a little bit more, but unlike alcohol, um, the, the ketamine is not going to disrupt your memory uh, like centers and you're more apt to actually remember what you go over. And not only that, you know, the, uh, the extra neurogenesis that happens over time um, can be helpful in just kind of allowing some of the, uh, the stuff to stick. Um, yeah. I, I, I know what you mean because, you know, p patients always ask and rightfully so, you know, what is it going to feel like when I, when I use, you know, ketamine? And I always say, you know, I mean, it's so hard to, you know, explain exactly what you're going to feel like. It's just like someone, you know, asking you, know, like, what does it feel like when you drink alcohol? What does it feel like when you, you know, smoke weed? Like, you know, it's kind of hard to um, explain those states. But I always say, you know, it's, it's more or less a dissociative state. And I do say exactly like you said, like the closest thing would be like a light alcohol intoxication. Like I have had, you know, some patients say to me that that's what um, they feel like when, when they use it. And then I have other patients that just say, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's kind of its own thing, which, which it is. Okay. And one thing too, and I'm, uh, you know, um, I've said this uh, before on the podcast is that, um, cause just because I know some people are out there, you know, really a real, uh, stickler. So ketamine technically, you know, technically is not a psychedelic. It's uh, it's an anesthetic, but it gives psychedelic like, um, uh, properties and, and benefits, you know, similar to, you know, psilocybin or whatever. Um, it's, it seems to have, you know, that immediate effect on, on, uh, depression. And one thing that, I feel that we need to kind of like tease out in terms of uh, the psychedelic world and treatment is like, you know, is, and I don't even know if this is going to happen, even, even if we have all the evidence, like if one psychedelic is going to emerge to be say like better for depression or one psychedelic is going to be emerged to be better for say PTSD over, over, you know, anxiety or something like that. But I will say for sure that for ketamine, um, it seems to be incredible for suicidal ideations. You know, okay. I have patients that, um, that tell me that they're, you know, suicidal, uh, you know, really feeling down, really, you know, wanting to harm themselves. They do find that it does take away that um, particular symptom. I'm not sure if you found in your practice, Matt, with, with ketamine, if there's been one particular symptom in terms of mental health, or if there's been one particular um, diagnoses, whether it's, you know, depression and PTSD specifically. Um, but, you know, have you, have you found that um, ketamine has been, um, you know, very effective for one specific diagnosis or symptom compared to others? You know, like the, really the, the two broad conditions that I've uh, used this for would be, you know, treatment resistant depression and um, extreme anxiety. Uh, yeah. which, you know, depression, anxiety, kind of like two sides of the same coin, so to speak. Um, and, and, it, and it has been helpful for both. Um, most impressively, though, again, I, I think I might have mentioned that um, the vast majority of my clientele struggle with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. And there's okay. not a lot of things that are all that helpful for that. And I have found that the ketamine does seem to be helpful for that, um, which is great. And do and you find, um, Matt, that it's helpful like immediately? Not like not after the first dose, but like um, within a short period of time, I mean, perhaps depending on how you're doing it again with the, the higher dosing sessions, of course, you're giving like multiple doses, um, like sequentially in a short period of time after somewhere around the neighborhood of like the second or third um, dose of that, then I do, you do start to see some, some improvement. Um, same thing is true with depression. Although like you mentioned, like suicidality, um, it's like, almost instantaneous for most people at the higher doses uh when when doing like the uh the psycholytic stuff actually a little bit similar i mean like it does seem like it takes um maybe two to three weeks or so to start to kind of like soften up a little bit and um then try to like like get into the groove and start like slowly progressing um again it's not quite as dramatic but at the same time a lot of my patients are very very anxious and, and a lot of them really don't want to like go blast off to outer space uh, and that's like yeah. the thing that they're most terrified of 
And so that's another reason why I say like, I start like very, very low, like titrate up slowly just to, to the effect that they can handle so they can get used to being in that quote unquote non-ordinary state. Um, and, and also pairing that with like, like meditation, breath work, that kind of thing. Um, and, and I haven't had anyone do this. I have had like two people that I'm seeing right now say that they are now interested in doing some of the higher dose stuff after having done the lower dose stuff for a while, just because like, they're now like, okay, I understand this feels safe. I'm, I'm used to this um, versus just, like I said, jumping in the deep end. And it definitely too um, uh, depends upon your, your body weight in terms of the dosage as well. You know, if you're, if you're a bigger person, you probably will require, you know, a bigger dose. And, you know, I said that, you know, I started a lot of people on, you know, 75 milligrams through a capsule, but you know, there was another patient I started um, this week on it, just, just 50 milligrams just because again, I, I don't want to, you know, push them o- over the top. And, uh, and the other thing is that I don't want someone to have, you know, a poor experience and then have to, um, you know, never look at psychedelics again in a positive light, right? Because we know that these medicines can be incredibly effective, but if someone's really, really struggling and then, you know, you give them too high of a dose and then they have, you know, a really poor experience, then they may not look at, you know, psychedelics again as, as potential, you know, therapeutic treatment, just because they have this, you know, one really, really, you know, poor experience. So, you know, I do think it is, you know, definitely um, important to, uh, to, to go, uh, you know, uh, low and go slow and, and see how people do. Um, but one thing too, you know, you mentioned that uh, it was very interesting was, uh, you know, you have a bit of a d- different treatment protocol for, um, for chronic pain patients versus your um, mental health patients. And sometimes, or a lot of times, I should say, you know, patients who have chronic pain also have, you know, uh, mental health uh, struggles um, as well. So, you know, how would you treat those, those patients um, differently? I mean, that is, um, I'm, I'm kind of looking at ketamine as just like a, like a pain medication because it is, it has been used for like chronic pain, like cancer pain and stuff like that in the past. So um, instead of doing it, say like twice a week or maybe three times a week, dosing it basically every day, uh, but it, uh, it is slightly lower dose. And then um, also the, the two folks that I'm having, like instead of doing the, the subling, well, they do take it orally um, and like one's on like 50 milligrams, the other one's on 75 milligrams. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, I gotta say that, you know, my, my patients who use ketamine who have really, um, uh, you know, really bad pain, they say that, you know, when they use the ketamine, especially like during it, um, when they feel a little bit dissociated, it's like almost complete resolution of their pain. And then, um, and they say that that does, um, you know, linger a lot for the rest of the day, maybe not a hundred percent, but they're still, you know, substantially reduced. And then, you know, the next day, some of the pain may come back a little bit. So, you know, it seems to have, um, a bit of a longer effect, uh, mentally on patients than, than it does, um, uh, on, on pain. And again, obviously that, that, that depends upon the dose and that's just been my you know experience. And there has, and there are some people who, you know, do use ketamine only, um, several times and, and do feel substantially better. But again, you know, some of those patients may not have, you know, severe, severe depression. So, you know, um, you know, cause patients ask me this all the time, like how long, you know, should I be on this? And you know, have some patients that have, you know, been on it for basically, you know, the full two years that, 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 I, that I've been doing it. You know, there may be some breaks here and there, but you know, more or less they'll use it consistently. Um, but then I do have some patients that, you are just going through a really rough time and they just need it for about one month. And then after that one month, you know, they're done, you know, and then, you know, maybe in six months time, they'll feel like, you know, um, they'll need it again. But, you know, I think that's something that we um, sometimes, uh, you know, try to put our patients in like, a box sort of thing and say that, you know, you need to take this medication every day for, you know, the rest of your life. But, you know, sometimes, you know, life is not always just like, you know, constantly down, 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 like sometimes it's, you know, up and down. So, you know, sometimes, you know, during those ups, you know, you may not need any medication to help. And then, you know, during the downs, you know, sometimes you do. So I think that, you know, ketamine is, is, is very unique in that way, because you wouldn't be able to do that with, you know, an antidepressant, because a lot of people find that, you know, SSRIs, you know, take weeks or so to kick in. And, you know, there's, there's withdrawal effects from coming off, whereas my patients, 
should say that they have like no withdrawal with coming off of, of, of ketamine. So, you know, I do think that it's um, a medicine that's much, much easier to come on and off than, than a lot of the other medications that we have out there. And I don't think that we should be afraid to use it as sort of a on and off um, medication. So I don't know if you have some, some patients that you've, you know, maybe prescribed it to for a few months and then they, you know, feel better maybe for six months, maybe even a year. And then they say, you know, I'm kind of feeling down again. Last time I used ketamine, it was super helpful. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that you've come across in your practice or, or in the research that you've done. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and the vast majority of the people that I'm utilizing ketamine with, I'm using it to like augment other medications, to be fair. Um, and so what, what I've mostly seen is using the ketamine for a while, as they're feeling a little bit better, I'm able to titrate down on some of the other medications they're taking. Um, and then, you know, as things are going good for a time, maybe they don't really need the ketamine. But to be fair, a lot of them still need some level of like, like a baseline other med, but it's still like, I'm a huge a huge, huge believer in like less medicine overall, the better, as long as you're doing okay. Um, and like I said, so I, I, I have had other people in particular, I'm thinking this one chronic pain person, uh, we've, we've gotten this individual off of basically everything. There's like one other medication they're on a very, very low dose of, uh, and they're just getting over to ketamine. Um, but again, that person is using ketamine on a regular basis. So, so it's a little bit of both. Um, but still like it, it does seem to be helpful, like we people away from like the, the chronic medication route, um, rather than, you know, having to take a pill every single day. Yeah. I'm happy you mentioned that just because, uh, you know, a lot of my patients have been able to reduce their other medications and, and many times come off of them completely with the use of, of ketamine. And those medications can be, um, you know, SSRI, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you know, commonly described um, antidepressants, SNRIs, um, and even benzodiazepines, you know, and, uh, and also sleeping um, medications. You know, ketamine, you know, I tell my patients, you know, don't take it before, before bed, even though a co- a one or two of my patients say that it finds that they, that it helps them sleep. But we do know that sometimes if you take ketamine before bed, it can cause Um, nightmares. But, you know, that being said, um, you know, I, even if you take it in the morning and it doesn't, you know, it seems kind of counterintuitive um, that it may help you sleep that night. But if you're just someone who's really, really anxious and that's why you can't sleep, well, if it's taken away that anxiety and, you know, that, um, and that effect persists into the nighttime, well, then of course you're going to sleep better overall. So, you know, I'm not sure if you found that um, in addition to, you know, reducing um, medications. Like, have you found that some of your patients report that they even sleep better at night when they're using ketamine? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and I, I have the the opposite uh, perspective. I normally say like evening time or even sometimes nighttime. Uh, granted, there is a, an increase just for nightmares, but it's much more like just vivid dreams. It seems. Um, and that's true. It's it is more vivid dreams and nightmares. I, yeah. that's, that's, I'm happy that you said that. Yeah. And I like to also coach people about um, uh, various different like lucid dreaming techniques, uh, because like, okay. if you're having vivid dreams or nightmares, you know, like one thing that if you, it, it really, this is like, it takes time to practice, but if you're able mm-hmm. to determine like you're in a dream, then, uh, and you can stay in a dream, then you can make anything you want happen. And some people really enjoy that. Um, that sounds so- super cool. I want to hear more about this actually. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, I mean, there's not, there's not a lot to it. There's a ton of different um, methods, but the, the two that I recommend people is like um, just in, in your daily waking life, uh, when you walk into a room, just kind of look around to see if there's like a digital clock or something um, to read um, and, and like just note the time on the clock or read the thing, but then also like read it twice. Uh, the reason being is like in a dream state, if you look at like the numbers on a clock, probably it's not going to make sense or like the you know, the tens of hours are going to change. It's going to say like 4792 or something that, that's weird. Uh, or if you read something, it might make sense the first time, but the second time the message might change or you might literally see the words moving around. Uh, and, and those are clues that, oh, wait, hey, I'm in a dream. Um, getting used to doing that is actually the easier part. The harder part is staying in the dream because nine times out of 10, when somebody says like, I am in a dream, they, they wake up. But to be honest, again, if somebody's struggling with chronic nightmares, 
uh, or even like super vivid dreams where they feel like they're not getting a lot of rest. Sometimes just that, like waking up briefly, that little bit of a respite, be like, oh, wait, no, that's a dream. Okay. Um, they can kind of go back in and it's a little bit better. Or um, every once in a while, you know, they can stay in a dream and um, you know, do whatever they want. Um, my, my favorite story about this actually was uh, with a seven year old um, that I was doing this with, and she was having a lot of nightmares. And she came in one day and just said, Dr. Brown, Dr. Brown. Um, I, ha I had a bad dream last night and then I realized I was in a dream. I was being chased by zombies and, and then Pancake Man showed up and he did a silly dance and he scared away the zombies and then we laughed together. Um, and so, so I like to tell that story because it's a true story. And if a seven-year-old can do it, then I feel like almost anyone can do it. Awesome. So we're kind of like missing out maybe on, you know, capitalizing on, on some of these um, dreams that, that people are having and they may in fact be, you know, therapeutic overall. Well, in, in kind of the concept of, um, you know, even like PTSD therapy, it, again, in kids, one of the, the tactics of dealing with trauma is some level of play therapy, right, where you kind of reenact uh, whatever the, the, the trauma was with like dolls or something. But then um, instead of being the victim, they somehow come out as being successful and that, that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times when you're having like nightmares, uh, this is like replaying some kind of a thing that you're worried about or some kind of a traumatic thing. And if somehow you can kind of change the ending so that you are, you're not the one like that we pushed off a cliff or murdered or something like that, um, and, and that you're somehow successful, then that might turn from a bad dream into a good dream. Yeah, that's that's very interesting because I know there's um, I don't know the the name of the technique, but I know that some people will um, who have PTSD they'll kind of replay like someone almost like speaking to them or like following them around or like criticizing them even when they're like by themselves. And I know that there's a technique that people have where like when they you know recognize that that that's happening, they'll try to like change it. So like instead of someone you know criticizing me, you try to you know, um, have it so that their person's like cheering you on or, or is, or is, you know, saying something like, like positive to you. So it seems like, um, you know, the story that you just told, like, that's what that, you know, child did, you know, the pancake man came along and, and scared everyone away. Right. So in that way, you know, instead of it being, you know, negative and like someone's chasing me, it's like someone here is protecting me, you know, and someone here is chasing them for me. And, in essence, that, you know, makes that person feel loved and feel and feel protected, which, you know, is ultimately, you know, what we all want in the end is, is really just to, you know, feel loved. And then when you feel loved, that's, you know, when you're going to feel at your best. Whereas, you know, if you're just constantly sort of, you know, judging yourself and criticizing yourself and imagining that other people are, are judging you and thinking about your past and your PTSD, then you're going to, you know, stay in that, sort of like negative state, you're not gonna be able to move forward. But if you, you know, can try to, you know, teach yourself that, um, you know, when, or, and can be aware that, you know, when you're doing that, when you're having all these, you know, judges and, and criticisms of yourself, if you can kind of flip that and uh, like, like your patient did, you know, I think you can get, you know, pretty dramatic results overall. Agreed. And um, one thing too, I, I wanted to mention, because I know that uh, people are uh, researching this now in terms of ketamine, is um, do you also uh, find that it can, you know, and we said that it can be helpful for, you know, taking people off of, of pharmaceuticals, but what about people who are, have, you know, substance abuse disorders? Because I've seen that um, people are using now ketamine for alcohol abuse. Have you had any, any success stories or patients who have, you know, decreased or eliminated alcohol use with the, with the use of ketamine? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I have not utilized uh, ketamine for really any sort of substance abuse issues other than maybe, um, like I said, overutilization of benzodiazepines. Um, but so, no, I mean, I couldn't speak to that, to be fair. Okay. Okay. And then, uh, you know, one thing that I wanted to, to chat with you about today. So there was a recent um, microdosing study that came out you know, a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, some people are kind of like, jumping over all the results. I know that um, uh, one uh, common person that we follow, uh, Robin um, uh, Kahart Harris, I think I'm saying his name right, um, kind of criticized it a little bit and, and, uh, and thought that there were some errors in it. So, you know, what did you um, think of that study uh, overall and, and what kind of impact you think it has for, for both uh, patients and for, and for uh, um, clinicians? 
so so remind me this is the the study that paul stamets was trying to be a part yes. of with the um like basically you just download an app and you can kind of like talk about anything that you're utilizing there right yeah exactly that's that's the exact one that i'm, that I'm talking about yeah yeah um so to be fair like i, I skimmed over that uh sure. but uh broadly um you know my understanding of of microdosing overall right is that true, true, true microdosing? Um, it does seem like it, there's not a huge differentiation between that and placebo, right? And when I'm saying true microdosing, this is like sub perceptual doses of you know, any kind of a psychedelic agent. Um, however, you know, once you get up into the realm of uh, you know, just like minimal perceptual dose or something that some people might consider like quote unquote museum dosing, where you have like your colors just a little bit brighter that kind of stuff. There does seem to be so, some efficacy that this can be helpful um, for both like uh, anxiety and depression. Um, the one rub though is, you know, depending on like the agent and also depending on the individual, if they're more on the anxious side, um, sometimes like that anxiety can actually be slightly exacerbated um, and then they don't really like that. And this is one of the things that I think that um, isn't captured as much um, in really almost any of the studies because i also feel like most of the people that would have that issue they're probably not even going to either finish a trial or even do it to begin with because like they have like one or two like poor experiences and they're like oh my gosh no this isn't for me um the reality of that is though that if you know if you have some level of um support going through that process it's it's it might be curious to see like how much of that anxiety is just sort of um the the subconscious bubbling up to the surface um, as psychedelics are known to kind of do. Um, and if you can kind of process that out, will you be able to move forward that way? Um, and, and so that's, so my take is, yeah, no, this seems very, very promising, but like almost everything else, it's useful to not necessarily um, go on your own, just, just in case. Uh, just, and, and again, I'm, well, we're both physicians uh, and I'm a psychiatrist and I was trying to err on the side of caution. Uh, so just like having somebody there to, to kind of fall back on that if you're having a rough time, discuss things with, uh, because sometimes if you're just doing this by yourself, it, it, it might not necessarily be helpful um, and not just like not helpful, but you might think uh, you're, you're feeling a little bit worse or actually feel worse. Yeah, I think that you definitely have to be, you know, careful with these substances for sure, because for some people, you know, you absolutely can have, you know, uh, a bad trip. And, um, and, and the worst part about, you know, having a bad trip, in my opinion, is, you know, we kind of mentioned this before, it's not necessarily the bad trip. It's that, because you have that now your perception of psychedelics is poor and now you're not going to get the benefits of it. So I think that, you know, like, like your approach of like, you know, going, you know, starting low and going slow is more necessary probably for, for psychedelics than, than any other medicine, just because there is the potential to, um, to have a bad experience. And then again, you know, once you have that bad experience, you know, you're, you're very likely to kind of like shut out the, the use of, of any further um, psychedelics. And that's, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's not good for someone who um, is, is struggling because, you know, they, these medicines can be incredibly effective and, you know, just that one experience can then, you know, deter you from, 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 from using them. Right. So I think it is, you know, very, very important that we, you know, stress to people that if you are going to use them, you definitely want to start low and go slow and you want to have the right set and setting. Yeah, well, and then not only that, as far as like the bad experience deterring you from psychedelic use, but I mean, notoriously, and even, uh, you know, Groff talks about this uh, in a lot of his writings that, you know, if you do have um, like, like, what a quote unquote bad trip, oftentimes this is because like something is is bubbling up from the subconscious and some kind of a conflict that, um, you know, you've been struggling with, but you've been kind of pushed away and, you know, into the box. Uh, but, but now it's there and it's manifest. And if you can't move past it, like while you're um, in that non-ordinary state, well, now it's stuck in your conscious mind. Um, and so, so not only like, do you have to deal with there, that's going to probably like just eat away at you just in your, in your regular daily life until such time as you process it out some way, whether that's through um, you know, another psychedelic session or some level of psychotherapy or, or some other means. Um, and so really that's the, that's the biggest concern because it's like, um, it, well, it could, in a sense, transiently make things worse just by presenting the thing that's bothering you and so now that you're, you're just walking around with it all the time 
Yeah. So like when you, I mean, you know, obviously we're not advocating for people to um, suppress things, but you know, people, but like, you know, we do suppress things to protect ourselves. Like there's some yeah. type of protective mechanism there. And then the thing is that when you use these psychedelics, a lot of the times these things that are suppressed get lifted to the surface and then you have to deal with them. And, you know, if you take, you know, too high of a dose, um, you know, there's probably going to be more things that surface that's going to make it more difficult. And then if you're in, you know, a very poor set and setting, um, you know, where you're not comfortable, then, you know, you're going to have, you know, a good old freak out and, and a bad trip, you know, so um, it's, it's important for people to, to recognize that, you know, that is why, you know, people do have bad trips for, for the most part, we believe is that, you know, there's some type of emotion that's being repressed. And then all of a sudden, it's just brought to the surface. And, you know, again, like the higher the dose, like likely more of that um, is going to be brought to, to the surface. And then, you know, you're not going to be able to kind of like deal deal with it. And then, and then, you know, you do have this kind of freak out and bad trip sort of sort of experience. So again, you know, start low and, uh, and, and go slow. Um, so, you know, one thing that we chatted about just, uh, before we started, um, the podcast is, uh, is NAC, um, so mm -hmm. anacetylcysteine. And I know that you're, you know, very, very interested, um, in this compound and I'm very interested in, in it as well. So, you know, how did you get, um, started into NAC and, and how do you utilize it with, with your patients if you do? So, so I discovered NAC originally again in, in residency, like most things. Um, and I was working with um, uh, a young girl who was autistic. Uh, she was, uh, she wouldn't walk on her own. She had to wear a helmet and she was on uh, a lot of medications. Um, and the reason why she was in a helmet is because she was like punching herself in the face quite frequently. Um, and, you know, she, she tried a lot of different medications and I thought like, well, let's, let's try N-acetylcysteine because there is some evidence that uh, this can help with like irritability with, uh, with autistic folks. And, and we started that and it was somewhat dramatic. Um, like after roughly about three months, um, she didn't have to wear a helmet anymore. Um, and wow. we were able to, to titrate down on her antipsychotic medications from um, a fairly high dose of like, well, three different ones uh, to to a reasonable dose of one of them. Um, and she started to communicate a little bit more with her parents. And I thought that was like amazing. Um, and so that's where I discovered that in the system. So I read a little bit more about it. And it's actually um, also on the, like the official, like published like OCD treatment algorithm, as I mentioned, like I deal with a lot of OCD folks. And um, it seems to be one of the things that can help a lot with uh, looping repetitive thoughts and well, like irritability that, that goes along with that too. Um, so, so that's one of the things that I use it for most frequently. And, and I found um, a lot of folks can gain some benefit from it. Incredible. Yeah. I I've seen a lot of good studies on it as well. Like I've seen it as um, uh, you know, and an, a good medicine as like an adjunct to for depression as an adjunct to anxiety, but you know, it may be effective uh, on its own um, as well. And, um, you know, I think that it's, uh, it's something that we should probably, you know, discuss a little bit more. And it's, and it's unfortunate, we were kind of, you know, talking with this a little bit um, before we got started here is that, you know, there's, it may be removed from, um, from the shelves in the United States. Is that correct? Yeah, there's, uh, there's rumors about it, like some of the, uh, the bigger retailers uh, that uh, were previously selling it or no longer selling it, you can still buy it from the various different supplement manufacturers and online. Um, but this is, this is kind of a problem, uh, just because it, it has been prescribable for a long time. I think it was like 1960s, uh, that, that it was made as a prescription substance, but it's been sold over the counter. And my understanding is the FDA has, um, given like warning letters and kind of said, Hey, we might make this prescription only like a couple of different times. Uh, but over like roughly the last year, like I said, that this has been pulled from a number of retailers and it's getting harder and harder to find, um, allegedly secondary to um, like a study being published that this might help with uh, lung function associated with COVID infections, which to me seems very ridiculous because like if this was actually helpful for that, which I'm not saying that it is, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But, but um, if, if that is one of the rationales for making this less available, that makes no sense to me. Um, and you know, like the, the reason why uh, we tend to get it over the counter is most times like in, insurance companies aren't going to pay for it because they don't consider 
like anxiety and indication uh, to use N-acetylcysteine. I mean, it's used for you know, Tylenol overdose or like cystic fibrosis, that kind of stuff. Um, and this, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of quite frankly pissed off about that just because like I said, it's been very, very helpful for a lot of my patients. And I'm very concerned that um, they might have a much harder time finding because they already are. Uh, and the ones that use it and really like it, they're trying to stock up because they're not sure if they're going to be able to get it uh, in the future. Yeah, that's that's kind of ridiculous, like because, um, you know, it's been used successfully for, you know, various different treatments. And then all of a sudden, because it may potentially be effective for again, we're not saying it is I need to look into the research just just as much as you do. But like we're not like it could because it may be effective for, you know, lung function in COVID-19 patients um, that, you know, that's the reason why they're going to pull it. I mean, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. That's like saying like, you know, you know, we know that vitamin D is effective for osteoporosis. We know that low vitamin D is associated with depression. Again, I'm not saying that if you, you know, have low vitamin D and you bring it, you know, to a normal level that it's going to fix your depression, but it may, you know, there's some evidence there. Same with like, you know, low testosterone. Um, you know, if you have low vitamin D, that also is, is, there's an association there, but like, you know, we have these known associations of vitamin D and then yes, we have teased out through, you know, some, some evidence that it appears again, I'm not saying that it's a replacement for the vaccine or anything like that whatsoever. I'm just saying that, you know, for the most part, it appears that, you know, um, having sufficient vitamin D levels uh, is, is, is associated with positive COVID-19 outcomes, whereas, you know, low vitamin D is associated with more negative COVID-19 outcomes. You know, that's what a lot of, you know, the research indicates. But, you know, we're not, you know, pulling vitamin D off the shelf now because of that. But it seems like with NAC, I mean, that's a similar situation. I mean, I know it doesn't have quite um, the efficacy in randomized control trials as vitamin D does for some of the other stuff as, as we just mentioned, as, as NAC does for, for some of the um, psychiatric disorders. But it certainly has some, um, you know, your patients have benefited from it. And for them to, you know, pull this off the shelf just because, you know, it may be um, associate with an improvement in lung function, COVID-19 patients is, you know, absolutely ridiculous. And I think it's completely irresponsible. I, I 100% agree. Um, and, and it's terrible. And actually, we do have a decent amount of evidence for, for a number of different conditions. I mean, like John Grant at the University of Chicago, where I trained, he did a lot of research on n acetylcysteine. And again, that's why, like, that's where I was training. And that's where I like, like heard about it. And he was talking about it for uh, use of autistic folks, uh, like, like OCD, um, it, it even like various types of a, like, like addiction, um, in particular, mostly yeah. like stimulants and gambling, um, it can be helpful and for like, and, and um, to, trichomania uh, too. Um, like yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yes, absolutely. That too. Yeah. He, that's, he studied that as well. Um, and then, uh, for vitamin D, you know, I can speak to like, if you have severely low vitamin D levels, like I have seen some people, um, like they're, they're like, like 18, um, like you replace the vitamin D and if they're, they're also depressed, like they very well can be not very depressed after that. And this is one of the reasons why it's important, um, you know, again, psychiatrist, but like, you know, physician first. And so like do basic labs, um, yeah. you know, like, cause if your vitamin D level is super low, if you have thyroid problems, if you're struggling with thyroid, anemia, yeah. just like yeah. fixing the underlying cause can oftentimes like be the thing to be most helpful rather than you know, starting on like an SSRI. Yeah. So sometimes too, I find I do a little bit of um, like not a ton, but I do a little bit of, of hormone uh, work as well. And some guys have like, you know, super low um, testosterone, like when, when they come in, I'm like, well, no wonder, like you're feeling so low and you have no energy and, and no motivation. Like you have, you know, no, no testosterone and some, you know, women, you know, when, when they're going through menopause, and again, this is one of those things where sometimes people only need it for a short period of time. Um, you know, they get tremendous benefit in terms of, you know, improvements in their mood and, and things like that with regards to using, you know, a little bit of uh, estrogen and um, progesterone, you know, so definitely like, you know, I know we're getting a little bit, um, not necessarily off topic, because we don't really have a specific talk with that we're talking about today. But, you know, the in terms of, you know, looking at other treatments in terms of, um, you know, treating your depression. Yeah, like be a, a physician first and run your labs, you know, like, you may find, you know, low thyroid for sure can cause uh, depression. I had a um, physician recently tell me that, you know, he, he had several patients who, you know, um, were, were depressed, and, and a few of them had, you know, low, low TSH, low thyroid. 
or sorry, high TSH, so it'd be low thyroid. So, um, you know, so, you know, it is good to kind of look at all the, all the labs, like you said, to make sure that, you know, there, there's that we treat the, the underlying cause. Um, but just coming back to the knack for a second, but I mean, this is, you know, a, a medicine that's been used in emergency departments though, as well to treat like, you know, um, acetaminophen, Tylenol uh, overdoses, you know, very effectively. So, you know, it's not like it's, um, some new, you know, like foreign medicine or some strange, you know, supplement, like we're talking about something that, you know, has been sold over the counter for, for years or decades. And also some that's been used in emergency rooms. So, you know, I think that we're, you know, doing a great disservice to people by, you know, removing this from, from, uh, from uh, the shelves. Yeah, quite, I mean, there there seems to be, in my personal opinion, there's no reason to do it. The, the safety window of the stuff is so huge. Um, you're almost certainly not going to over, I mean, you have, you have to try. Um, yeah. and, and even still, I don't even know, like, I'd have to look up to see what the LV50 is, but it's like, it's, it's high. Um, yeah. And like, I, I just, I don't personally see any rationale for it. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. It's just um, we- limiting access, which is sad. And uh, like, I, I know, again, we, we were talking about how maybe pull from the shelves, but I know that in, in Canada, so I have a, a small IV clinic that, that I run, and we do do, you know, some IV and acetylcysteine. And we just noticed that, you know, we were getting it for like, six, like, you know, very, very cheap. And then all of a sudden, the price, like, you know, almost tripled. Um, you know, and how much we were getting it for. So now, you know, it's unfortunate, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to, you know, charge people a little bit more just because, you know, the vials are becoming so, so expensive. Um, so I think that, you know, there's, there's some type of, of movement, you know, against, you know, uh, N-acetylcysteine that's, that's going on right now. And, and I know that too, um, just coming back to the, to the COVID thing. And again, you know, I'm not saying that it definitely helps with COVID or anything like that, but there's a drug called uh, busilamine that's, that's used for um, uh, rheumatic arthritis. You know, it's real big in Japan. It's been used there for like 30 years. And they say that that, you know, restores um, your, your glutathione about 16 times more than um, NAC does, which oh, wow. is you know, apparently the, the main mechanism of action that they're speculating for in terms of treating um, in terms of treating uh, COVID. So, you know, we, we know that NAC has, you know, so many good mechanisms of action. We know that, you know, it's been used um, over the counter safely. You know, it's been used in emergency rooms safely to treat things like, you know, acetaminophen overdoses, which, you know, you would be more familiar with than I would be, you know, considering, you know, you're, you're a uh, psychiatrist, you probably have, you know, deal with a lot more people, you know, who are dealing uh, with uh, suicidal ideations and, and, and suicidal actions. So, you know, it is a safe drug. And I, I can't believe that, that it's not being, um, that it's, it's not being, you know, recognized as a safe drug, and it's potentially being being pulled. But hopefully, you know, the government, you know, recognizes that and listens to conversations like this and recognizes that, you know, this medicine needs to be um, you know, utilized, uh, it, it should, can be utilized safely, but by the public. Now, I wouldn't be opposed to say them saying that, like, you know, like in Canada right now, you can get cannabis from a dispensary or you can go to your doctor and get it prescribed. Like, I would be okay with that, you know, if, say if someone said, you know, because I understand that particularly, you know, in, in your practice, if you have, you know, a child who's only six or seven years old, you know, maybe you don't feel, that comfortable going to, you know, uh, a supplement store and asking someone at the counter, you know, what should I use for my son for, for autism? Just like, you know, a lot of, you know, patients that I see, I do have, you know, uh, quite a few um, uh, pediatric patients that use CBD oil, you know, but they don't want to go, those patients or the, sorry, those parents, which I completely understand, you know, they don't want to go to a dispensary and talk to a bud tender about, you know, treating their, their child with, you know, with the CBD oil, they'd rather go to a physician. So, you know, I, I think like both systems can, you know, exist, you know, because just like the, the child who you said was seven years old, um, that came to you and had, you know, dramatic, um, uh, had, had a dramatic response to, to, to the neck. I mean, that parent probably, you know, felt a lot more comfortable initiating the neck coming from a physician than say from, you know, going to a health food store and, and, and initiating it there. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, but, but as long as also it, you know, cause like it, it used to be like what, $3 for a uh, one month supply. Yeah. And now it's like $10 for one month supply. Um, 
And so uh, if this is going to be like, okay, now it's prescription, it's going to be $30 for one month supply. That's like, quite frankly, ridiculous. Uh, yeah. But also, I'm glad that you brought up like the uh, the analogy a little bit with the, with the cannabis thing. You might be able to speak a little bit more to this because like um, I consistently said the concept, at least the way that we do it in the United States of medical cannabis is, is kind of a joke. It's, just, it's like not medical uh, <laughs> in, in most of the respects because it's, it's very, very similar to saying like, you know what? I think you need antibiotics. I'm not going to tell you what antibiotic you need, but I think that you should try antibiotic and antibiotic will make you feel better. Now go talk, now go to the antibiotic store and talk to the dude behind the counter and he might be able to give you an idea of like what some of the other ones do and you pick, can pick the antibiotic that works for you. Um, <laughs> I don't know. What, what do you think about that analogy? I mean, I mean, that doesn't seem like good medicine to me at all. You know, it's, 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 so I don't, uh, I don't think that's a very good system. Well, no, but I mean, like, is that because I feel like that's kind of how medical cannabis works, because you say like, and to be, don't get me wrong, like I, yeah. I have, um, I, I've signed off on medical cannabis for a number of clients. Um, but just like the, the way that most people are doing it, it's like, okay, go try some cannabis. Um, and then they don't have any guidance. And they're talking to the bud tender behind the counter and be like, yeah, man, this will make you feel like this or that. Um, rather than talking to the physician about like, okay, these are the different strains and these are the different cannabinoids that are in the different strains. And these are the, this is the efficacy of the different ones. And this is what it might do for you and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I'm just, because, because my yeah. understanding is you do a, a fair amount. Uh, yeah, no, I, I do. I do a, a ton of cannabis and you're absolutely right. And you know, what happened, I found, I'm actually happy that cannabis became legal in, in Canada because it's actually helped my practice in a lot of ways. Because the thing is, is that when someone was coming in to see me before it was legal, you know, they, it's, it's hard to say, you know, whether or not they were going to um, you know, buy it from, from me or buy it from the street or, or whatever it was, you know, so you're kind of, you know, putting a lot of like trust in, in that particular patient. Um, but now, you know, now that it's legal, I mean, you know, if you can just get cannabis, you know, at a store, you know, why would you go to your doctor for, for cannabis? So I know that all my patients now, you know, are definitely, you know, using it medically. So I think that it's kind of helped in that regard overall. And, you know, I trust that my patients before were, you know, using it uh, medically as well. But at the same time, you know, some of those patients may have been using, you know, one, one strain that, you know, worked for them really well. And, you know, they don't necessarily need to go to a doctor to get the exact same thing, right? So, um, you know, overall, like, I'm okay with, you know, the medical system and how it's, it's working in Canada right now. But, you know, very similar, I think, is, you know, may happen um, to, to, to anacetylcysteine. You know, I feel that, you know, there's people who are going to be using it over the counter, but there may be some people that, you know, want to go to a doctor, particular if, you know, they have, you know, a small child and, and they want to initiate them on something for, you know, a, a, a diagnosis of, you know, autism or something, you know, that's fairly um, severe or that does affect their behavior overall. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. You know, so that's, that's kind of the way I, I see things uh, in Canada right now. Um, Matt, I hate to do this, brother, but uh, our, our time is basically up here right now. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize how, how fast we, we were going, but uh, I guess time flies. We're having a good conversation. Um, so, um, you know, before uh, we, we, we uh, leave here, can you let everyone know where they can find you online, where you practice medicine and, uh, and anything else that you're doing? Yeah, sure. I mean, really online, and I'm not as uh, active as I was before, but uh, at Dr. Matt Brown on Twitter, uh, that's probably really the only social media thing that I kind of do much of anything on. Uh, I do have a practice in Chicago, uh, psycharts.org. Um, it will get you there. I also have a, a, a fine art gallery that's attached to so space and time gallery. Uh, it's just space and time dot gallery. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, that's where to find me. Awesome. Well, brother, thank you so much for coming on uh, the show. You know, I really, really appreciate your insights and everything that you had to, to share today. And uh, we'll put this out next week and I'll, I'll make sure to, uh, to tag in all that type of stuff. And we'll have to do it again sometime soon. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. I, it sounds like we could probably talk for a long time. Yeah. I think next time I have to book it for, for more than an hour. Cool. Happy to do it whenever. Okay. Thanks again, brother. All right. Thank you. Take care.